two passages in our scripture reading today, starting in Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 7, which is in the middle of the paragraph, and we're going to read through verse 16, the end of the chapter. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle. For our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young, but an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. It must have been the fall of 1980. Think about where were you, you were about that time, the early Reagan years. I had been on stage, quote unquote, on stage maybe twice before. But that first semester of high school, which is where I was in 1980, I tried out for my first real play. It was a fiasco, but I was hooked. The next spring, we did a musical. This was the first one in our little high school in who knows how many years, but a, a new director had come to town. That, the reason we had a fiasco in the fall play is because it was just a teacher that needed to fill a hole. And she really didn't have an idea what she was doing, but we got a new director and that's that spring musical and everything started to turn around. Despite my heavy engagement in sports, band, studies and everything else teenager, I threw myself into the fall play and spring musical all four years of my high school career. Our director was fantastic. A few of us even did summer and college work with her after we graduated from high school. She loved her crap. She loved us. She had high standards. And she was a conscientious builder of young hearts and minds. It was a beautiful season of life. I recall one time our senior year, I believe it was, where she made a hard call that we as students did not understand. By this time, our fourth year in being seniors, you know, kings and queens of the high school, there were a few drama standouts. I was one of the guys 
and a good friend of mine was one of the girls. So when the fall play cast list was posted, it made sense for me to be playing a major role in that show. But what did not make sense was the fact that her name was not on the list. The lead female role was given to a young one, a freshman of all things. And my friend, the senior, was given another role. It was listed, but not as the cast. She was the stage director. Now, none of us really knew what that was. It seemed odd. It seemed less than. You're not on stage. You're the stage director. It didn't make sense to any of us. But our wise director had a number of rational, mature reasons for that decision. And in her wisdom, she was also setting my friend up for greater future success. The show was Dracula, of all things. And the vibe, the look, and the feel of that entire show is dark. Okay, does that make sense? And my friend's very blonde hair, perky personality, and strong stage presence with those said characteristics did not fit in to this dark play. Secondly, our show is going to include a lot of props and even some minor pyrotechnics, which got us all kind of excited. Attention to the details for each and every rehearsal and every show had to be virtually perfect, demanding the attention of something we really never had to have before, which was a stage director that knew their stuff and was gonna be responsible. And thirdly, our director saw more in my friend than just being a stage actor. She had the potential to do much greater things in this space. And this was an opportunity to give her real director experience working side by side with someone we considered to be a master at her craft. Something our high school had never really done before. Have a student director. Our director director had a vision. Again, she knew how important it was for the stage to be perfect every single night to set the stage perfectly for every rehearsal and every performance. Secondly, she knew that through decisions nobody else would probably understand or agree with in the moment, she was setting the stage for my friend's future, giving her necessary skills and experiences that she would need at the next stage of her life in the theater. This little absolutely true story serves a couple purposes for us this morning. One, there's a surface lesson going on and it speaks to today's message. We're gonna take a little bit of time this morning setting the stage for our next sermon series. It's a stage set that will flow throughout our messages in the coming weeks. It's important that we have the stage set properly. But on a deeper level, this story underscores a proverbial fact that will also flow throughout this sermon series. The fact that difficult decisions made in the present more often than not, will lead to reward and fruitfulness in the future. Difficult decisions made in wisdom and understanding and forethought and vision can and will more than likely bear much fruit in the future. So all that being said, Let's take just a few moments this morning, laying some of the groundwork for our upcoming sermon series entitled The Disciplined Life. And I'll just say right at this, right at the outset that this is a, a little bit different than um, a lot of messages that we have. And sometimes we'll do this at the outset as we set the stage for a series. 
Um, uh, but uh, some people don't like it when we have a message like this. And I just want to put that out there. Uh, and that is, you know, we're not necessarily going to a text and exegeting the text and pulling the text out. We're setting our hearts and minds up for doing that in the coming weeks. Okay. So our scripture reading, we're going to come back and read one of those again. They're kind of the basis for our conversation today, but it's a little bit different. So let's lay some of that groundwork. Three concepts that I would like us to appreciate as we enter into this extended discussion on the discipline life. And the first comes from author, speaker, uh, professional coach, all that stuff. He, I mean, he comes from back in the past. His name is Jim Rohn. And he was originally, correct. now, nothing new under the sun. Somebody may have said it before him. But when I look at the different people that have said what I'm about ready to say, he kind of becomes the origin of that comment. And that is this statement, that you and I are the product of the five people we spend the most time with. Have you heard that before? I've said it, and I will often add another addendum to that, which would say not only are we the product of the five people we spend the most time with, but also the, five, uh, the books that we read, okay? Now, but, but mo a lot of people, I would say most people in our society don't really read bo books, let alone nonfiction books, so we can just stick with the front, but we become the product of the five people we spend the most time with. Now, why is that? We get on the surface, think, okay, that sounds kind of interesting. It sounds like it might be true. And it certainly was, it, it, it's common knowledge in the development space, but why? Well, I propose to you, it's because we are very malleable creatures. Even in our physical space, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but the, the, the length of time that it takes for us to replace all of our skin, it's incredibly short. Because we, as a physical body, are sloughing off skin and creating new skin cells all the time. To the point where our entire layer of skin around our body is replaced on a regular basis. We are a malleable creature. What we ingest into our system goes throughout our system and contributes to our health or lack of health. And the same is true for our minds and our hearts. They're malleable. They change over time. The only thing that really sets things starkly into our psyche, into our hearts, and into our minds might be trauma. And that needs a lot of work and uncovering and discovering and, and healing. But for the most part, everyday life, just like the foods we ingest, just like the shedding of our skin and the growing of new skin cells, it, skin cells, it is just a, the nature of our being. We are malleable. We have inputs and we have outputs. And our, we are continually in a constant process of change. And it is most significantly influenced by the stuff immediately around us and in our recent past. So the people that are speaking into your life are the five people you're closest to. You could call it six people. You could call it four people. I don't care. But the people that we have in our lives or the books that we read, which really translate into anything that we allow into our minds, through our eyes, that we, we ingest. It could be the, the television shows that we watch. It could be the news that we listen to. It could be the papers that we, we read, the periodicals that we read, but whatever we ingest into our heart and mind through uh, what we are viewing or hearing through our senses or the people that we hang out with. Now, why is that? Again, because as people, we associate the things that are common around us as good, acceptable, righteous. And if somebody that I trust thinks a certain way and I'm around them on a regular basis, 
I can start to adopt the way that they think. I can start to adopt their behaviors. I can start to adopt their mindsets and their philosophies and their structures of life. Oh, you're doing that and it's working for you? I'm going to try that. Because we are malleable people that are being shaped by our environment. We know this instinctively because we care about who our kids hang out with. But do we take note about who we hang out with and what we do and what we ingest and what we spend time on? We have malleable hearts and minds and lives, and therefore we are under constant influence that has an effect on who we are becoming. And the disciplines that you and I are going to discuss in this series, it's important that we come into them with that context. Because they are not meant to just be a to-do list of activities. Oh, this is something that, that is a good spiritual discipline, so you should do that and check the box and we're good. That's not the purpose of spiritual disciplines. They're not meant to be objectives. They don't earn us stars or points on somebody's credit list. But rather they put us in a space that allows proper influences on our heart and on our mind and our lives. They put us in the room where God does some of his best work. They acknowledge that we desire God to be one of the five that we spend the most time with. That's a sobering question. If you and I were to list our top five influences on our life, would God make a list? But these disciplines, again, acknowledge that we do desire for God to be one of those five and that his word. God's Word is one of the most influential books that we can consistently invite into our formative process. Now, again, the majority of people in this world have never picked up a book since their last date in school. It's a sad truth. And that number becomes even smaller if we're looking at nonfiction versus fiction. And if that is true, how is God's word, his influence, getting into our lives? Because I've said it before and I'll say it again. What we do here for 20 to 30 minutes on a Sunday morning isn't enough. And I don't mean that to sound like bah, critical. It's just a statement of fact. So the first thing that we want to carry into this conversation around spiritual disciplines or the disciplined life is that the people we hang around, the books we read, the influences that we invite into our life matter because we're malleable creatures. It shapes us. The second uh, observation or factor or concept that I want us to carry into this conversation is the fact that not all growth is healthy growth. Now, as we age and we mature, we understand this. That's why we have things called biopsies. Because not all growth is healthy growth. And the methodology and value of spiritual disciplines, they have been proven over the centuries, literally. And there are all kinds of newfangled thought processes or motives, even for classical disciplines. But we might, in today's world, say, that was good then, but today we would do this. Or I would rather try this pill or this shortcut or this 
easier methodology hoping for the same results, but they are classical for a reason. They've been around for centuries for a reason because they're proven and they work. And they were practically taken for granted for, uh, by our forefathers. So much so that as we read the scriptures and we come across a spiritual discipline, you will rarely find the how-to on that spiritual discipline. Jesus went off to a solitary place early in the morning, and he prayed. Well, what did he say? How did he? Was he kneeling? Was he standing? Was he? Did he do it five times toward? What? what what's the methodology here, folks? Well, so much of this in early human history was taken for granted that we don't see a lot of how to. So we're going to talk a little bit about potential how to's to get into some of these disciplines. Because in today's world, they're virtually forgotten, ignored, and even shunned by the masses. We don't need that anymore. We have this. Unfortunately, that's true even within the walls of the church. When we take a look at some of these classical disciplines, some may seem absolutely foreign to you, foreign to me, because we've never been taught how important they are or the role that they play in our spiritual growth and development. So not all growth is healthy growth. And we want to look at the tried and true and proven methodologies that put us in the room where God does his best work. And the third concept that I'd like us to consider as we enter into this sermon series is the difference between shallow and deep. Now, again, when I say those two words, they have a definition to you, right? You understand when the water is shallow, when the water is deep. Don't dive here. You can dive over here. <laughs> we understand the concepts. But what do they mean when we're talking about our humanity, our growth, our lives? We rarely really talk about this. In most cases, that there, there are a couple anecdotal times when we talk about shallow versus deep. When we meet someone who is completely superficial, that doesn't even know us, doesn't want to get to know us, just has these big smile on our face. Maybe it's a used car salesman, not meaning to throw everybody under the bus, but you know the stereotype. That's a shallow person. Or someone says something that just kind of catches your ear and you just have to turn your head and you have to think about that for a moment. You're like, that is deep. So we understand this concept of shallow versus deep. And we know what it feels like to be in the presence of a person with compassion and wisdom and purpose. And the question that I have for you and the question that I have for me is this. Which of those people do you want to become? Do you want to be a shallow person? One who's skating by in this life and kind of has some basic relationships and and uh, understands the general workings, but um, is just trying to get by? Or do you want to be a deep person of passion and wisdom and purpose and meaning? Do we want to live a life with conviction and understanding? The path toward depth of meaning in our life's journey, particularly if we claim to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, these things that we're going to talk about apply even beyond Christendom. I'll tell you that right now. But within the life of the disciple of Jesus Christ, the path toward the depth of meaning and wisdom and purpose and passion is where we are headed in this conversation 
It is my firm conviction that the life lived on this stage of understanding and wisdom and purpose is found through a consistent practice known as the disciplined life. One last point for today. Discipline does not have to be a four-letter word. If I were to just come up and just say that word, most people would shy away from it, would brand it as yuck, as I'm not, I, no, I want to live free. I want to live, I, I don't want to have this felt sense of burden of discipline. And my charge to you is to reframe your understanding of that word and not allow the negative connotation to dominate. I understand the temptation. I understand why it's there. I want to eat cake too, every day, every meal. But our need to simply reframe the purpose of the word is where I'm going. Because the discipline life is the healthy, tried and true, effective, proven, and dare I say, only path to any highly desired destination. If you want to be super fit, it takes a disciplined life. If you want to be super wise and, and knowledgeable, it takes the discipline to dive deep into a specialty. You want to get straight A's, you have to study. You want to become the best in your profession? It takes hard work and discipline and a willing to do stuff that most people would never think of doing. I'm saying that not to say that is the, the only way to live life. I'm saying that you and I know deep down in our spirit, it's the only way to live a successful life. is to understand that the path to, uh, man, I really don't even want to use the word because it has so much connotation in it, but I'll just use it very loosely and freely. The, the, freely, the, the path to winning is the path of discipline in any field, in any endeavor, and it's true in the ball that we call life. So I want to spend some time over the next few weeks introducing you to some of the classical spiritual disciplines. If I named a few of them off right now, you'd probably, oh, I've heard of that before. Some of them, maybe you haven't. But when's the last time that you actually spent time or I spent time going through them? Now, they are deep disciplines, so we're not going to do the deep dive. We're going to cover them at, at a top surface level. And my encouragement to you would be to come to an understanding of what they are, the value of them, and to begin to take baby steps into incorporating what does it mean to live the disciplined life through spiritual disciplines. So I want to introduce you to some of these classical spiritual disciplines, practices that are According to author Robert Foster, central, absolutely central to experiential Christianity. Without them, you don't get there. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean you're not a part of the family of God. But it does mean that we, are, we would be unable to explore the depth and the richness of the life that I believe God is holding out for us. I want to repeat our scripture reading this morning out of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul is talking to Timothy, who is the preacher, if you will, who is the discipler. And he says, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, 
you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. So this is the path, if you will, of the good minister. I want to be a good minister, if you will. And to be nourished on the truths of the faith. This is the idea of, again, ingesting this knowledge and this wisdom and this power, the truths of the faith. This is the depth of history that is speaking into what Paul is saying to Timothy here. And of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. That stuff that the world is trying to tell you, those wives' tales, those godless myths, don't have anything to do with them. Go back to the tried and the true nourishment of the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you followed. And train yourself to be godly. It's a training process. Not unlike going to the gym. Not unlike going to a dietary specialist. Not, only, not unlike coming, getting a prescription from your doctor to live a life more healthy. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So if you and I, through an understanding and a pursuit of the spiritual disciplines, can get a grasp on the depths of the richness of our, our history and our teachings of the faith, not only does that set us up for some future day in glory, but Paul says to Timothy, your life right now will be more blessed. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. If you'll recall when we read the scripture, Paul said to Timothy, this is for everyone. Everyone. <laughs> there's, there's no out. There's no except these people. This message is for everyone. That is why we labor and strive. Translation, hard work. Because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. This is where we are headed in the coming weeks. I hope you'll join us. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Oof. Would you prepare our hearts, our minds, and even our bodies for our upcoming conversation? on the disciplined life. What does it mean, Father, to invite you and your spirit and your wisdom and your knowledge and your love and your care and your character to be a primary, if not the primary influence on our lives? What does that look like? What does that feel like? What is that what promise does that hold out for us? Father, would you please call on our spirits to be open to what you would have to say to us around this conversation in the coming weeks. And even today, Father, as we wrestle with a few concepts, God, would you give us wisdom and insight and even a, a growing passion for your wisdom and your word. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you guys for being with us today. Glorious day. Supposed to get up in the 60s. Looking forward to it. Thank you for those of you that are with us online. Blessings to you. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll see you in seven.